All right. Uh, thanks, everyone, and welcome to my talk today. Um, I'm going to be talking about the Foreman installer uh, with the goal that everyone attending should, at the end of this talk, have a basic understanding of the installer architecture. Uh, and if you're interested in contributing to the installer, um, maybe you're working on some feature and some other uh, Foreman component, and some installer work is needed to support that feature. Um, at the end of this talk, you should you should have an idea what is the basic layout of the installer and uh, how can you contribute to it. So I want to get started with a question, um, which is a stupid question, but uh, I'm asking it because in addition to the stupid answer, there are, I think, some non-stupid answers. And that question is, why have an installer in the first place? All right, and the stupid answer is to install our software. Great, thanks, presentation over, we can all go home now. No, okay, the reason I'm asking um, is because I think there are better answers like uh, to define and apply the layout of our software deployment. So uh, the installer doesn't just install our software, um, but it configures um, and deploys the many components uh, that make up a Foreman or a Catello or a proxy server. Um, so the application layout uh, is uh, often determined in the installer for these components. At a base level, um, our installer consists of many Puppet modules, uh, like Puppet Catello, Puppet Foreman, uh, Puppet Foreman Proxy, Puppet Candlepin, Puppet Pulp, uh, Puppet PostgreSQL, uh, which by the way is, is not a module from the Foreman community. Uh, so some of these modules are Foreman community modules, others are um, from other upstream communities, but they're modules that we use. Um, and these modules, uh, comprise the basic building blocks that we need to install and configure our software components. I think there's an even more interesting answer still than the one I just uh, provided, and that answer is influenced um, by some comments my colleague Avowed uh, left on a, a recent uh, community discussion thread. Uh, and that answer is that the installer provides a uh, role layer, which is the scenario, and a profile layer, which is the answers file, um, on top of the Puppet modules. So um, really, using the Puppet modules alone, uh, an user could uh, install Foreman or Catello that way. It would be more work for them to do so. Um, they would you know, have a lot more uh, parameters that uh, they have control over right out of the box, and it, um, you know, would basically be more effort, um, but everything that you need to do it is there. So what we're really doing is um, we're really providing a unified view and some opinionated defaults um, for deploying our software that are going to make it easier for the vast majority of our users um, to get up and running quickly um, in their test installation or production installation, however they need to install whatever their use case, um, we make it faster uh, for them to do that and we uh, remove the need for them to learn Puppet. Okay, um, so I wanna look quickly at the installer architecture from the top down. Um, to get started, we have a library called CAFO, um, which provides us with everything that we need in order to organize some Puppet modules into scenarios, um, provide default parameters and persist parameters uh, via an answers file, um, run some arbitrary uh, Ruby code outside of the Puppet apply steps. Uh, this happens in hooks that can occur at different stages when the installer runs. Um, we also provide uh, something called checks, but it's it's a long-term goal to merge checks into hooks um, because hooks are basically more robust and powerful. So I'm not gonna talk a lot about uh, checks today because the thinking is that they are not long for this world. Uh, 
CAFO also provides logging, um, CLI options, um, and terminal output, and other basic things that um, you know and love when you install using the form and installer command. Um, so CAFO has some nice documentation. I uh, highly recommend everyone take a look at the readme. I'm not going to show it here because it's we just don't have time to go through all of it. Um, but definitely check that out. And then one um, useful thing you will find there, so here's the readme. You can see there's lots and lots of information that explains uh, what it does and how you can build an installer uh, from CAFO. But I want to highlight this. This is a diagram. There's a link to this in the readme that really shows everything that happens um, when you run a CAFO-based installer. Right? Uh, I want to highlight a couple things in this diagram. Uh, these sections in the, in the green, these green boxes, highlight different um, stages of hooks. Right? You can see at different points, we're um, loading the scenario. Uh, getting the configuration file for our scenario. Um, if any migrations, we'll talk about those later. If any of those apply, um, we'll execute them. Right, And down here, all the way down here is where we actually run Puppet. Um, and then we, you can see there are some additional hooks uh, before and after that. So in addition to CAFO, we also have the Foreman installer repository itself. This is a specific instance of an installer built with CAFO. Um, I have it open in my terminal right here. Um, so CAFO, uh, the Foreman installer provides uh, configuration for different scenarios. Let's look at one for an example, uh, the Catello scenario has this configuration file. Um, it defines um, puppet modules that are in that scenario, uh, perhaps some, some custom facts. Um, this is a, a new one that we added recently. We now allow uh, the verbosity to be set at the scenario level, right? So. Um, this is like the, the role layer um, that determines, uh, are we going to install Foreman? Are we going to install Catello? Are we going to install uh, Foreman proxy? Um, the various scenarios uh, determine what we're installing. And um, the, that is specified by the user at the command line when running the installer. Uh, although in the future, we may just ship one scenario with the installer and, and package a different RPM for each scenario so that you would just uh, install, say, a, a Foreman installer or Catello installer. Um, and that just comes with one scenario, which is the only scenario for that installer. Right now, we ship multiple scenarios with the same installer, and you just specify which one you're intending to use. Um, so we also have an answers file for our scenario. Uh, and this is used anytime we um, have some parameters in our puppet modules, which uh, we don't want to use the, the defaults from the puppet modules. We can set, uh, we can override those defaults and answers. Also, anytime the uh, user changes any of these parameters, uh, that will be stored in this answers file so that uh, when they rerun the installer at a later date, um, any changes that they made to the configuration with the installer, those are going to be persisted. We're going to um, store their parameters so that we don't forget them. And we can ensure that they uh, stay applied uh, across various installer runs. So we also have a concept of um, tiers of Puppet modules. I just want to show you real quick. Um, so I'm in a repository 
called Foreman Installer Module Sync, which is just used to manage common changes across all of our Puppet modules. Um, but I'm only really here right now to just, uh, because there's this nice uh, function here, which shows us the various tiers. Uh, and these tiers are not so important, except that they really um, help us think about um, what are the dependencies? How do uh, some of our modules uh, depend on other modules? So for example, the um, Puppet Catello, right, is in uh, one of these higher tiers. Actually, it's the higher tier that our installer cares about because Catello Devel is not an installer module. Um, so for the Catello scenario, as uh, we saw previously, the the list of um, puppet classes that are used in that scenario, um, including Catello and Foreman Proxy Content. These are um, some higher tier modules, uh, but then they have dependencies on um, Candlepin, for example. You have to install Candlepin to uh, install Catello uh, or Pulp. Um, so we can really think of these as, as being layers. Uh, with that said, uh, the scenario doesn't, the Catello scenario doesn't only include classes from form and proxy content and Catello, it also um, includes some classes from these lower tier modules directly. Um, so we already took a look at a scenario configuration file and saw how it defines um, which puppet classes we're using in that scenario. Uh, and we also looked at the answers file and saw how we can override the default parameters uh, for those classes. Uh, so I actually want to look now from the bottom up. Let's say I'm a developer and I'm adding some, some new feature to Foreman or Catello, uh, and how can I um, add the necessary code to, to manage this feature uh, in the installer. So for example, uh, one that we've done is making the pulp core worker count uh, configurable. And I have a commit here, uh, which just shows um, that we introduced a new parameter. This is in uh, manifest slash init.pp, which is going to be uh, the main, um, your, your main class for your module should be defined here. Uh, in most cases, if you introduce a new parameter, here's where it's going to go. The exception would be if you have some some class that's um, not in the main class, uh, like some some plugin class, as an example. Uh, but in our case here, we introduce a new parameter worker count, and um, we set what is going to be the default value for the worker count. Um, But one issue is that um, Puppet Pulp Core is not actually um, called directly by the Foreman installer, right? We, we saw the tiers and the, the way that uh, modules can include other modules. Um, so it's not enough. If we want the installer to be able to manage this worker count, it's not enough to define it here. We also have to go into Foreman proxy content and we have to expose uh, this parameter in form and proxy content, which is what the installer is actually um, interacting with. So here we have the pulp core worker count parameter. If we scroll down a little bit, um, you can see here, here's um, our pulp core class in um, form and proxy content. And this is the parameter we just defined in pulp core. Uh, now we're taking whatever value it has here in, in form and proxy content and we're assigning it. Uh, and so it works this way all the way up. Uh, for this particular case, uh, we only had to expose it um, in Puppet form and proxy content, um, but for other parameters, it may be different. Uh, in some cases, you may even need to uh, specify some some default in the puppet module, but you want to uh, override that default in the installer, right? Maybe you want the the module to work uh, standalone and and not be so opinionated, but uh, you want the default in the installer 
to set a different value for that parameter. So let's see an example how we do that. We saw the answers file already, um, but that brings up an interesting question. What if a user already installed and then at a later time, I'm adding this additional parameter or I'm changing the default that we had uh, previously? How can we, we handle this when the new user or the user that, that already installed is not going to be getting our new default answers file? They have their own answers file that they've, they've modified. Uh, for this purpose, we have um, migrations. And let's look at an example of one of these. Maybe, yeah, here's a good one. Uh, so a migration actually looks at uh, the answers and then um, can make further, further changes to it based on what it finds there. So this is really useful um, for cases where uh, someone has already installed with a, an older default answers file and we um, we want to make some change and we want to make sure that it gets picked up in their environment as well, we can define a migration that does that. Um, migrations aren't only useful for interacting with, with answers, they're also useful for, um, or they can be used to modify the scenario configuration itself. So I mentioned earlier that um, we now allow the verbosity level to be um, set per scenario, um, where previously it would be um, set, I think, as a, as a default uh, for the entire project. Um, so that's another case where you might use a migration to say, hey, uh, your scenario configuration uh, doesn't have this uh, parameter defined, but the next time you run the installer, you've got this migration, the migration is gonna run and it's going to add this additional configuration to your scenario. Um, I also mentioned hooks and I want to take a look at an example and just talk about um, why have hooks in the first place? Why do we need them? Um, one answer is that we, we can't do everything from Puppet or it doesn't make sense to do everything from Puppet. Um, another answer is we might want to add some additional options to our installer, like some additional CLI options, um, some routine uh, that we want to run outside of Puppet. Uh, maybe we want it to run before uh, Puppet apply. We already saw that Hooks can run at different stages and have different data available to them in those stages. Um, so let's take a look quickly at some hooks. Um, here's the hooks directory and form an installer. Um, we can see subdirectories for the various stages. Um, so let's look at the reset data hook. And actually you'll notice there are reset data hooks in multiple stages here. Well, why is that? Let's look at, all right, so in the boot stage, we have a reset data hook, which just adds an additional option, dash dash reset data. Uh, it documents this option, it sets a default, which is false. Uh, it would be very bad, of course, if the default were true for this. Um, and then in the pre-hooking stage, here's the actual logic. Um, when a user wants to reset all of the data in their installation, uh, drop their databases, um, you know, start over um, uh, with, with completely fresh application data, this is, you know, so then they pass dash dash uh, reset data to the installer. And then when we get to the pre-stage and hooking, this is what actually runs. We have, um, Here's the main reset function, which stops services. Uh, if we have a local Postgres database, it starts up the Postgres service. Um, 
you can see um, functions that, that do all of these things. Uh, if we have pulp three, we can reset that and so on. Uh, so that's, that's why hooks are here. Um, okay, I want to talk a little bit also about um, what are the current priorities for installer development. Um, the, the constant ongoing priority is that we um, always have to support new features uh, for Foreman and Catello and Foreman Proxy. Uh, anything that requires changing the actual layout, what does Foreman look like when it's installed on a user system? Uh, we always have to support that. So anytime a new plugin is added or, or new component is added, um, we have to make sure that the installer can install it. Um, but beyond that, we also have other priorities as well. Um, and a big one, an ongoing one currently, is improving the um, installation user experience. Um, so if you've ever looked at uh, Foreman Installer dash dash help or Foreman Installer dash dash full help, uh, you've probably seen um, maybe not quite a million different options. Um, and that's really a lot uh, for a user to look at when they're working with the installer for the first time. So we want to um, mark more of these as advanced and have the basic help menu um, if at all possible, fit on a single terminal screen uh, so that the, the user can see the most obvious options, the ones that they're most likely to need there. And then um, they can find their information about how to find the other options that have been marked as, as advanced. Um, we also uh, recently changed upstream from a um, progress bar style output as the default to log-based output as the default. Um, we think this is a better user experience for the installer um, because rather than seeing, okay, 5%, 10%, then I jump to 30%, now I'm stuck at 30% for 20 minutes, I have no idea what's going on. Um, we're kind of setting a false expectation there that um, these percentages are, are based on execution time. That's really not actually feasible to do, and we, we want to avoid that false expectation. So instead, uh, the new output should uh, show what stage we're at, and um, you know most, most of the logs will be hidden uh, uh, behind a more verbose uh, log level. But if they want to see that in the terminal, they can set a more verbose log level. Otherwise, they're just going to see some very high-level messages about, OK, we're uh, starting the hooks in posts now. OK, we finished those hooks. We're starting uh, the next set of hooks. OK, we're, we're running Puppet Apply. OK, an error occurred during Puppet Apply. We're going to um, display that error on the terminal. Uh, and then at the end, we're, you know, if there was some error, we're going to display a message that says, hey, here was the error. Uh, the desired configuration was not achieved. You need to address the root cause of this error and then run the installer again. Uh, another tie-in. That's a priority for us that um, really relates to both of the priorities that I just discussed um, would be having perhaps another scenario that's a simpler install that has more features uh, disabled um, by default. So the idea of something like a, a light scenario that's uh, easier to get started with if I don't require a huge number of um, bells and whistles. We don't have anything uh, to show necessarily at, at this time, but it's you know an ongoing consideration um, that we want to provide more an easier route uh, for users to get started, um, but still have all that complexity available uh, when a user decides that they uh, want or need it. Uh, and and Really, as we talked about previously, that's already what this installer is about because um, a user could, in theory, um, install from Puppet modules alone. And in fact, uh, some users do that. I think, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think our colleagues at ATIX um, 
just use the the puppet modules and and for them that makes more sense for what they're doing um, so the option is is there but really the whole goal of the installer uh, is to make it so that is not necessary uh, so that users don't have to learn puppet uh, or don't have to even deploy their own puppet infrastructure because of course the installer can do that as well we have the puppet puppet module for that Um, so the installer really, really is meant to make it easier to get up and running uh, with Foreman, Catello, Proxy, um, define the different roles uh, that we need for, um, uh, for different servers based on what features are needed on that server, uh, and allow the user to, to manage those in a simple way. So. Uh, I have a little bit of time left, and I'm excited about that because I was hoping to get to talk about testing a little bit. Um, so we test uh, at various layers in the installer ecosystem. Um, the Puppet modules themselves have tests. Um, for the most part, we um, have um, unit tests for the actual uh, Puppet manifest to just uh, see that they compile into the expected catalog. And then we also have acceptance tests uh, that actually uh, run a puppet apply um, and check that the system achieved the desired state. So maybe I'll just take a look at um, okay. My own. And so here in the spec directory is where we have our um, test defined. Um, we have some helpers here which just set up the test environment and um, define some common reusable tests. Um, Yeah, here's the main um, the main spec test for the pulp core class. Um, and this test is is again just uh, checking the catalog that's generated. Um, and we have the ability to say if we pass these um, parameters or these facts from the system, then we can check that the uh, catalog says it's going to configure the, the system in a certain way. So uh, we talked earlier about making the worker count configurable for Pulp 3. Um, so here's an example where we're testing that um, if we previously had six workers on the system and we are now setting that parameter to five workers. Uh, we have a test that it actually reduces the worker count from six to five, right? Again, this doesn't actually um, apply the, the Puppet um, module to any system. Um, it simply uh, compiles the catalog and checks in the catalog, okay, uh, we've got Pulp Core workers one through five defined here and we do not have Pulp Core Worker 6. Um, we also have the acceptance tests. So this is where we actually run some code and uh, check, for example, are these services running? Does system, system D have this service running on our test system? Uh, is this port uh, listening? so on. If I um, curl this URL, do I get the expected response? Um, so to actually run these, let's see. Nope. Don't have it in my test history, uh, command history. Um, so rather than digging that up, which would take me a minute, I have another 
thing that I want to show you, uh, which is at a higher level, what about um, testing changes in the Foreman installer itself? Um, yeah, so let me show you this. I'm sorry, I want forklift. Um, so I'm working on a feature in forklift that will allow us to um, build the installer from source and um, including um, a custom branch. Um, and this way we can um, test pull requests for the installer. You can actually um, have some automation which um, actually installs Foreman or Catello uh, using the changes that are defined in that pull request. Um, so let's look here. So I'm in the forklift repository. Um, so we already have uh, a feature here which allows us to um, use some custom PRs uh, for the Puppet modules. This, I don't know who implemented this, but it, it already exists at this point. Uh, and in fact, it looks like I was playing with this recently because I have one defined here, right? Um, Simply remove that. And then uh, here's the code that I actually added. Um, let's find um, Um, here's one case where I used this recently. Here, no. Here's a good one. So this um, is a pull request um, which um, checks if the um, subject alternative name entries on a um, on on the custom certificates that the user is supplying uh, are going to match the uh, subject common name. Uh, in fact. This is actually um, in the Catello search check script, which also lives uh, in the installer. We didn't talk about that uh, previously, but um, this script lives there, I suppose, because uh, we call it in some hooks. Um, in fact, now by, by default, if um, the user wants to use uh, non-default answers uh, for their certificates, meaning they want to supply some some custom SSL certificates, then um, now we're automatically going to run Catello search check um, in a hook uh, to ensure that they're not um, supplying some certificates that won't work. So what this PR does is it actually adds an additional check in Catello search check um, that checks if the subject alt name is present, um, then it should match the common name. So this is the PR number 590. So to test with this one, I could simply um, set this to true. Yes, we want to build it from source and we're going to specify a PR number 590. Um, and then I could do vagrant up, uh, sent us seven, let's see, Foreman nightly. 
Um, and then with those parameters specified, it's actually not going to install form an installer from the RPM. It will build it from source um, from the uh, from the branch that we just looked at, and then um, you can actually it will run the installer also, and you can actually validate that um, the installer is able to successfully install a a working Foreman or Catello installation using that code, and then you can SSH into that machine that you just installed and actually play around with it, um, try doing some things, create a host or um, Enable some content, um, you know. Test that that features work. Uh, of course, with with the feature that we're testing, we just want to see that it installs uh, correctly with the um, the default certs that we have. Um, and this this is probably going to take I don't know 15 minutes to run, so I won't force you um, to sit around and wait for that. Uh, so at this point, I think. If there are any questions, any comments, anyone wants to discuss further, uh, we could wrap up the presentation and move uh, to a breakout session to discuss it a bit further. Thank you, William. That would be great. Again, I'll just for post the breakout room to the chat. We have two minutes before Tomer begins. Thank you very much. And um, I hope that the conversation can continue over in the other space.